Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. Uh, so, anyways, we're going to get started here. I want to welcome you to CS 411 or 811, depending on if you're undergrad or a grad. Uh, so, it's called Four Languages and Computability for 411. It's Theory of Computing for 811. So, my name is Dr. Daniel Page, but you can just call me Dan or Daniel. So, that being said, uh, my email is daniel.page at uregina.ca. Uh, our course website is on your courses, I presume because people have found the links and everything that they know how to get to your courses. Um, just a few to-do items. Uh, so we'll be talking about the course outline today, but I recommend you review that. There's a lot of nitty-gritty things in there. Uh, another thing is that uh, for the final exam, uh, I'll talk more about this later, but for the final exam, we'll be using ProctorTrack, to my reluctance. Uh, but uh, to do this, it requires so-called an onboarding quiz. It's just a little quiz with one question. It just wants, it's just for the process of calibrating things for Proctor Track, which will be what we'll be using for the final exam. Um, so just do that as soon as you can. I think I set it for some point towards the end of the month by the, by a deadline. But, uh, but yeah, you can give that a try and take a look at that. Um, other than that, uh, assignment one will come out next week on Labor Day, but there is no classes on Labor Day. I just want to give it to you just in advance if you want to take a look at it. Uh, you'll have plenty of time to finish it. I always like to make sure you have plenty of time to do this stuff. Anyways, I'm going to migrate over to the other part of the set so we could go through the course outline. So give me one moment. I'm just going to shift on over there. And by the way, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat or just interrupt me, okay? Um, one recommendation I have is just, if you're not talking, just uh, mute your microphone. Just It makes things a little easier in case uh, anybody has difficulties hearing me. But I think we're doing pretty good. <laughs> um, doo -doo 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 -doo, just got to move things over because I have two screens going on. So, it's, uh, so I have to migrate the Zoom stuff over to the other screen so I can see everybody. Okay. I'm going to shuffle on over. Hello, everybody. See, now we're over here. Okay, so can everybody see the course outline on the screen? Awesome. Awesome. So, like I said, just take a good look at this. Uh, I do have office hours. For example, I had office hours this morning. Um, but yeah, so Mondays and Fridays in the morning. <laughs> I like to keep it nice and early if you really need to. Um, and Wednesdays, I also have at 1130 till 1. So there's plenty of time in there if you need to stop by, if you have any questions about the assignment or you have any concerns you want to talk about, more than happy to do that. Or if you say a bunch of you want to come and talk to me, that's also cool too. Um, uh, one thing uh, worth noting, and this is worth, it's a really important note, is I'm not going to require you to buy a textbook for this class. Um, instead, I'm just going to have reference textbooks uh, that if, say for example, if you wanted to have something additional to read along with the lecture notes and the lectures, uh, you can pick up one of these two books. The, the course is going to follow pretty closely both of these books. So it's going to be sort of like if you took both of these books and you sort of hybridized it. Uh, that would be the best way I could describe this course. Um, the, so I'll describe, I'll just briefly mention a couple small things. Uh, first, uh, the the book that I tend to follow quite closely is, is this one. It's called in Automata Theory, Languages, and Computation. It's the third edition. This is sometimes in the theory community, we call this the Cinderella book. It's like a classic. Uh, so the first edition was back from like the 1970s. Uh, but it's essentially uh, everything in this course is going to be found in a book like this. It's a classic. But the big remark I do have is at the time of this lecture, this book is very expensive. It's kind of insane. Um, if you find yourself time, just go to like Amazon and type this sucker in and try to find a new copy of it. It's don't just don't do it. Don't do it unless you absolutely need this book. You don't need this book. Just be clear. Um, but you probably can find used copies for much cheaper if you really want to find a copy of it. It's a it's a good book. Um, I will warn you just about this book by Hopcroft at all, is that there is an international version of this book. I did pick it up just to see what it's like. I warn you, this book has typesetting and printing errors in it. So you might find this one on Amazon, for example. It's much cheaper than what the book I just presented, but the type, it has some serious print issues in it. Uh, there's figures that are mislabeled. Some pictures have been changed between this international version and this one. 
Uh, so I just, the main content in the body of the text is exactly the same, but it's uh, some of the figures which would be helpful because there's a lot of pictures in this class. Uh, you might find it not as useful for that regard. So I just made sure I put a warning for that in the course outline for you. A book that, uh, I know it is at the bookstore, but it's also a book that is a bit cheaper to get your hands on if you really need a book, is this one by Michael Sisper. Uh, so this one is, I find that the language used in this course is a little easier to follow than the one in Hopcroft. Uh, so if you're finding yourself something you want to read along with things, for most most of the topics you'll find, especially towards the later parts of the course, this one might be a little bit more handy if you're looking for an alternate perspective on the things I'm covering here. So I just wanted to make a remark about that you do not require any of these books. And you probably, if you're clever, you might be able to find them online. I, I can't say anything more about that, but uh, are there any questions about that? So just, uh, you don't need to get a textbook. I'm gonna have lecture notes that are gonna be available after each lecture. For, they're gonna be based on what I write on the board and they may have more details to help if say if I wanna add more examples or things like that. Are we all good to go? Okay, I think we're good. So I just wanna give a general gist of what this course is about. Just to make it easier, if you did find yourself getting one of these books, I've crossed, I've, set, I've laid out all the sections that are relevant for each part of this course. If you really, because this is one of those courses where a book, if you really find yourself getting lost, is actually quite helpful. Because this is a, like I said, it's a, it's a theoretically intense course. Uh, so if somebody is not very familiar with, say, doing mathematical proofs and things like that, having a book that you can read along with it can also be helpful. But like I said, not required. Uh, so this course will really kind of start off with me giving some core terminology involving languages and strings. So we're all talking about the same language pun intended, uh, the, um, and then we'll be moving into talking about so-called regular languages and automata with those. So we'll be talking about how we can design automata, their limitations. Uh, we'll also be talking about different kinds of automata. So these are abstract machines that we can use to compute certain things I'll talk about later on. And in relation to this, we'll also be talking about regular expressions. Has anybody here ever heard of regular expressions before? Yeah, so we'll be talking about regular expressions from this formal side. So you're gonna find out that these automata that we're gonna talk about actually have a counterpart with regular expressions and they actually have some matter of equivalence between them. It's actually quite fascinating in its own right. It's one of those things that I find with a lot of students, it clicks, like as soon as you see something like that, you really start seeing, hey, this actually is kind of interesting. <laughs> mm. uh, because regular expressions are used quite often in all sorts of things like, uh, like, uh, I'm just trying to think of so many, there's a lot of places regular expressions get used, especially when you want to dissect large pieces of data, like bodies of text, and you want to read patterns and things like that. Regular expressions are often used for that. Um, then we'll be moving on to more powerful machines. You're going to find that the first part of this class, I'll be talking about different models of computation, and I'll be building up to more and more powerful models of computation so that we can solve more problems. So. We'll be moving into context-free languages. So I'll talk more about what a language is and everything, but uh, we'll be moving up to things such as having the ability to have a stack, for example, which on a computer, if you know a little bit about systems, you know a stack plays a very important role in a computing system, like your system stack where you have stack pointers and stuff. Like this is where you're gonna find that sort of correspondence start creeping in. And then we'll move our build our way up to so-called Turing machines and we'll talk about limits of computation, which is quite fascinating. So I'll wrap more back into this stuff when we talk about it more when I get to the board. But there's kind of this last part, I'll be talking more about not just the limits of computing, but more of this relationship we have between efficiently solved problems versus those that are, that we, we believe them to be very hard to solve, <laughs> but they are solvable. So-called intractable problems. So I'll be giving you kind of a, a high view of this from a Turing machine standpoint of so-called time complexity, which you probably have seen in previous courses. So I'll be formalizing it a little further and I'll be talking about MP completeness and all of those fun things. And with the have time left, I will probably talk more about different complexity classes. So some of the stuff, if you've taken 340, for example, you may have seen some of these things before, but I'll be kind of approaching it somewhat more formally. So just as a gist, uh, a lot of this I've already talked about, but uh, 
well, we this is a, a synchronously del delivered course, so I'll expect you to come to class. But like I said, after lectures, I'll post the videos on the YouTube channel. I have a link of that. I added that onto the Your Courses page. Um, and uh, the link's here also in the course description. Uh, other than that, um, office hours, I've already told you about that. Zoom etiquette, I think everybody sort of got the hang of this. Uh, just remember, just don't be shy to ask questions. This, I must warn you though, with this class, it's kind of the way I like to compare this class is to like an introductory programming class when you first learn how to write computer programs. And you ask, oh, in this programming language, how can I do X? Or how can I do this with blank? Uh, these are very common questions you would ask in like an intro programming class, right? Um, in this course, you'll find that there's sort of an, an analog to this idea, where instead you might be very compelled to ask, can I do X with this machine? Uh, I want you to avoid asking these kind of questions because they take a long time to answer them sometimes, unless it's related specifically to what we're studying. Uh, because, like I said, we're really starting at the bedrock. Where we're going to talk, talk about these very abstract machines, <laughs> and we'll be building these things. And you'll see, and usually the answer I'll give you is, try it for yourself, unless I could tell you straight off the top of my head that they probably won't be able to do it. Uh, so are there any questions about that component of the course outline, or are we all good to go? I think we're good. I think we're good. Remember, just don't be shy to ask questions. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so for this course, uh, there'll be five assignments. Uh, so they'll be spread out pretty nicely. I like to make sure you have plenty of time to finish the assignments. So I won't like throw an assignment at you and you have like a week to do it. No, I usually like to make sure you at least have a couple of weeks at minimum to work through the whole assignment. So I usually recommend start it early and do it in pieces uh, because a lot of these assignments will be very much where you're sitting around thinking about stuff and maybe drawing a lot of pictures and trying to think about how you can express what you wanna say in words. Uh, because a lot of time we'll be talking about proving stuff or we'll be applying concepts from class. So I might ask you to design a machine that does something. Uh, but when I say machine, I mean like this very abstract thing. Uh, We'll have a great time about this. It's gonna be fun, I, I swear. It's just, you gotta get your head into the game. That's really it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so all the assignments are gonna be written. There's no programming assignments with this class. Um, there are two take-home tests. These are gonna be open book tests that you can complete. Uh, I'll be giving a time window for you to complete them. I haven't yet decided at this stage, I'm right now talking to the information people about what would make more sense if I make the take-home test more of like a assignment item that you can submit in, or if you would do like a quiz like the final exam will be like. Uh, because the final exam will be an actual, like an actual like proctored exam over your courses using the quiz module. Uh, so I might, I might try one or the other, or we might do all of it on your courses. I mostly think about this because of pictures and you have to draw a lot of pictures in this class. <laughs> Um, but yeah, generally these are going to be open book tests, so you'll be able to use whatever you want from the course, as long as you aren't cheating, obviously. Just don't look up answers and try to find, like, work together on this stuff. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, one caveat is that if you're in the graduate course, you're also going to be required to do a brief interview with me. That I'm trying to decide on the timeline for it. It might be 10 to 15 minutes where I'm going to just throw a bunch of questions. We're just gonna have a kind of, the way I best describe this is a Socratic discussion, a dialectic, where I'll throw questions at you and we'll just have a discussion about those types of things. And I wanna just gauge your understanding of the material, the big picture ideas. This won't be like the exam where I ask you to do something very specific. It'll be more about specific things, but they're big picture ideas. So I may ask you about like I talked a little earlier about regular languages. I might ask you about, oh, was there some relationship between this machine and that machine? I may ask you big questions like that. So I would just generally want to gauge your understanding of the material. So that's exclusively for the grad students. And also for the grad students, each assignment will have basically one extra problem. So that's main, the main difference between the two courses. Uh, you can take a look at this mark breakdown. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, just don't hesitate to bug me about it. Uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, so beyond that, uh, there's a lot, a lot of the stuff is just generally just take a peek at the course outline. 
Um, I do have a general format I would expect you to submit your assignments in. So include a title page. You're going to be submitting to me PDF files. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, other than that, uh, don't be shy to give me details on assignments. So if you really aren't sure how to solve the problem, remember, I, I want to also see your, like, if you really just aren't sure how to approach it, you can always just explain to me what you tried doing. Uh, that's always another thing you can always do. Um, but the big thing I want to hit on in terms of the assignments, I'm not flexible when it comes to deadlines for assignments. So I give you plenty of time to finish them. So I give you a deadline. That's the deadline with the exception of accommodations. Uh, so if say some extreme circumstance happens or you have an accommodations from accessibility, uh, those are the only things I can really think of uh, that would kind of go outside this. But I must remark, and I mentioned this in the morning for my 340 students, is that I, with the date itself, I'm pretty open. So I will tell you that it's due by midnight of that day. Uh, so by 11.59, but I'll leave the submission open till maybe about 7.30 in the morning. So, and I won't penalize you if you submit during any time during that night time. So on paper, it says 11.59, but I'll let you submit any time during the night. Because it doesn't really beat, it, it, it defeats the purpose if I'm anyway only going to be able to see it in the morning anyway. And I know that some people, they just have this thing where they click very well at late at night and sometimes they crunch. I don't recommend crunching with a class like this, but uh, it does happen. Hopefully I'm clear about that. But yeah, just take a look at the take home tests uh, section. Uh, as I mentioned here, if I cancel any of these tests or say I require you to like, say say you missed the test, uh, I'll reweigh it towards the final exam. And uh, of course, just if you need an accommodation, you have to let me know in advance. Like, don't let me know the day of, that, that's not good. Like, let me know like well in advance. I have the uh, the date for the exam, the time. You're required to be at this exam. Uh, it's all doing done online using ProctorTrack over your courses. So just take a look at this message that uh, the university has on your own time. But I want to talk about academic integrity. This is very important. I know that people have had this beaten into their skull many, many, many times. <laughs> but I need to always say this. Uh, so it's very important with a course like this that you do your own work. This is an individual effort-based course. So, so if you are doing your work, you're not, it's not supposed to be representative of your friends or your classmates. It's supposed to be only your work. So I'll give you a bit of a tip when it comes to a course like this. If you want to talk about, say, the assignment, you can talk to your classmates about the assignment problems. You may discuss some ideas you may have, but don't. Like if you write anything down, you throw it in the trash. You don't let anybody leave that room with anything written. Uh, that's one way you can encourage yourselves to write it for yourselves. Uh, and I don't mean that in a clever way. Like don't like do it and copy and paste or something. I mean like straight up, like you do not want to give anything that would give you me indication that you copied it from a friend uh, or that you cheated. Uh, because I take that very seriously. And with the class like this, it's really important that you try and do the assignments because they are also a part of the learning process with a course like this. So I generally design the assignments so that it applies things that we see in class. So it's very important that you try everything for yourself. Um, but at the same time, it's also like, you, you don't want to cheat yourself out of learning something. That's the biggest thing I want you to take from this is that if you cheat, you cheat yourself out of learning it yourself. And you don't want to do that regardless because it's academic dishonesty and this university takes that very seriously. And I take it especially seriously because I'm really big on standards. Um, so that being said, take a look at this academic integrity section. Uh, Hopefully I'm clear with everybody. So you can talk to your classmates about the assignment. Just don't, I recommend, do not write anything down when you leave that discussion. Just talk about it. That's it. Uh, no, obviously don't record each other that do it. Like I know there's so many different things you can do online these days, but you get the general principle. It's, that it's supposed to be your work. And you don't want to give me the impression that you, 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 that you didn't do it and try it yourself. because. That's a really important part of this course because this course is what I would, cons I would consider this course for some students very challenging. And I want to make sure that you understand like 
because when you do that to yourself, you're robbing yourself of that challenge. And by overcoming that, you become better informed. That's the easy way I could describe it. Just as a remark for tutors, like if you have a tutor, don't add, talk to them about the assignments. That's usually what I recommend. I used to tutor for a number of years. Um, it's usually a good practice for a tutor not to be doing your homework for you, <laughs> period. Um, so you can talk to them about concepts in the class and stuff, but just don't get them to do your homework. That's absolutely not cool. Even then they shouldn't be doing in your, anyway, they should be showing you how to do things. Um, that being said, if you needed accommodation, uh, you can contact the Center for Access uh, Student Accessibility. Um, and also, of course, uh, if you need to uh, reach out to me, if, say, an extreme circumstance happens, uh, do let me know in well in advance, and I'll, we'll see what we can do, okay? With a class like this, it's a little smaller, so it's a little easier to manage this kind of stuff. However, remember, I'm very strict about dates. Uh, as I remarked earlier on, um, there is a classroom recording policy. I will be recording these lectures and I'll be posting them on YouTube, but I'll only be recording what you're seeing and listening to right now. You won't be hearing any of your classmates in this video, nor will you see them, your names or anything. So that being said, don't worry. I mainly did this because one, I respect your privacy. And at the same time, like I seriously do. Like I'm obsessed with privacy. Um, the the hence my reluctance with Proctor Track. But the um, my point is is that if you are really like if you if you're concerned about these things, don't worry. Uh, especially when it comes to participation, I really am big on wanting students to participate in class if they have questions, because this class can go like if you start losing track of things over a long period of time, you can get lost in this class very easily. I'm, I try to make it not happen, but it is something that happens. Um, other than that, you have to contact me if you want permission to record the lectures. Uh, like I said, they're going to be on YouTube, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Are there any questions about that? I just want to make sure I'm clear. Wonderful, wonderful. But yeah, no, that's everything I really have to say about, about, the, about the course outline. Are there any general questions about the course outline before we get started? Okay, I think I think we're good. Uh, if you're, if not, you can always ask me after. I'll hang around after lecture. Okay. Uh, so, anyways, let me jump on back over here. Okay. <laughs> let me just get on back. And do, 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 do. Every time I do this, I have to move the chat and all that. But we'll be generally hanging out over here in this le in this lecturing area. I usually like to lovingly call it the learning zone. <laughs> it makes it fun. Uh, anyways, let me just move that over. I just need to make sure I have everything here because I want to make sure I can see anything if uh, if anybody wants to talk about anything or has a question. Okay, I think I got everybody. Oh, yeah, and don't hesitate if you need to raise your hand during this. If you're, say, say you're a little shy about asking a question, you really just want me to hold off until I ask about questions, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Uh, so don't be shy. It's, it's one part of the learning experience is, is you get to poke at my brain. You can do it during office hours. You can do it any time you like. Just always see if it matters and it's relevant to the lecture. Okay? Are we all good? Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to start talking about some basic terminology before we kind of creep into the bigger ideas. So let me get in that. So we're going to talk about some basic terminology. And then we're going to, so you're going to see that as I talk about more terminology, is going to build up to the main concepts of this course. So I'm going to start off with really, like it's going to feel like I'm really just starting at bottom level basics. So I apologize if it comes off really basic. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to define is something called an alphabet. So. An alphabet is quite, as the name would suggest, you might know different languages like the English alphabet or other alphabets that exist. If you think about letters or symbols like that, that's the conception of what an alphabet is. So 
It is a, a finite, it's a finite, non-empty, non-empty set of symbols. So often when I talk about an alphabet later on in this class, I'll often use the symbol capital sigma. So just if you ever see sigma, that's usually I'm referring to an alphabet. So I want to give you some examples just so everybody is clear. Uh, okay, so here's some examples. If I said, told you that sigma is equal to the set 0 and 1, can somebody tell me what kind of alphabet is that? Somebody, somebody tell me. Somebody's got to know it starts with a B. Binary, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> perfect, yeah, it's the binary alphabet. So that's what we'll call it, the binary alphabet. So if ever we want to talk about what we're going to talk, like I said, we're going to even define what a string is. Um, so if we want to talk about binary strings, they're built out of the binary alphabet. Okay, here's another one. Okay, if I have A and say I have A, B, C, D, all the way up to lowercase z, this is of course the set of all lowercase, set of all lowercase letters. And you don't really have to go the, like be like, oh, I have to define it all like this. It might be a really big alphabet. As another example, I'll just kind of loosely write it here. You might even define an alphabet to be the set of all set of all ASCII characters, which is something that you would encounter, say, say in a system, for example. So, like I said. Alphabet, nice and simple, right? So it's just a set of symbols. <laughs> okay, now with this, I could talk about strings. <laughs> like I said, it's really starting simple and we're gonna build up. So just at first, just uh, keep that in mind. So I'm gonna describe a string as follows. So you may be familiar with what a string is. It's, what's a string? Can somebody tell me? Like, what do you think a string is? It's just a sequence of what? Correct. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's exactly it. It's a C. It's a. It's a. Do, do, do. I'll just write it down. That's pretty much on the nose. It, I'll say a finite sequence. A finite sequence of symbols from some alphabet. Like I said, nice and simple so far. Just as an example, I'll write out some, some fun examples here. If I write 110010, what kind of string is this? That's a, starts with a B. It's a binary, it's a binary string, exactly. I just mostly, the reason why we have to go through some of this terminology is we need to make sure we're all speaking the same language. Like I said, pun intended. <laughs> You'll see what I mean in a moment. <laughs> Is a binary string. Um, let's see, here's another one. Uh, if I give you kitty cat, a kitty cat like this, uh, you would know that this is a string using symbols from A, for example. Is a string from, from alphabet, alphabet A. So likewise, as you might guess, you can define the length of a string in the most intuitive way possible. If I told you what's supposed to be the length of a string, somebody just tell me what, it, what it's supposed to be. What's the length of a string supposed to be? Like if I asked you, what's the length of a string? Just use your intuition for programming. Well, well, let, I'm just asking for a definition. So like, what would, what would I call the length of a string? How, what, how would I define that? Would I just say, say what, what would it be? Like, so for example, if I give you this binary string, what's the length of that string? Exactly, the number of symbols that are in it. Perfect. 
<laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so it's actually let me let me move on over to the other board. Let's let's go on over to the other board. We're moving, we're moving this way. <laughs> okay, let me write out the like that what we just said. Uh, the length of a string um, is the number of symbols, is the number of symbols. And if I give the name, if I give a number, it's a length, and I'll give it a name x, it's the number of symbols in x. Often you'll see it's denoted as x like this with the bars. You might know that as carnality notation. So the denoting the length is just going to be those bars. So just as an example, if I give you if I give you the string zero like this, and I put the bars here. Now let me make sure that they're much taller than a one would be. What's the length of this string? Like what what would be the result of this? It, one. It's just one symbol. Exactly, exactly. So if I take the other two, I already told you. See, the thing that makes this I'm not the biggest fan of this notation is that it looks a lot like a one. <laughs> That's the only criticism I have of this notation. Is if you work with binary strings, you really have to like make the bars really stick out. So how many do I have here? Six, exactly. Six. How about kitty cat? How many how many symbols do I have in kitty cat? How many do I have in eight? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Perfect. Bam. Now I need to define one other notion, and this is gonna look a little strange at first. Uh, but it's a very important concept that's going to be a little different than what you're maybe used to thinking about. But for some of you, it'll be like, okay, well, whatever. I'll give you the natural analogy in a programming language. Um, I'm going to define something called the empty string. Sometimes it's called a null string. So you might guess it's a string with no symbols. <laughs> It's just a string with no symbols in it. No strings. Uh, sorry, a string with no symbols. I'm going to denote this with the Greek letter epsilon. So whenever you see epsilon, you got to think empty string. Some in some uh, some communities they use also the Greek letter lambda, but uh, for us we'll use epsilon. Okay, so I'll, I'll let me elaborate on this in one moment. So, so if I asked about the length of the of the empty string, it's equal to zero. But it's remember, uh, this is actually exactly what you're pointing at is the following: that that string epsilon is not a symbol. It's not a symbol in an alphabet. So the first thing to point out is that it is a string. It's not a symbol. So if you gave me a language and sorry, I haven't even talked about languages yet. If you gave me a set, if you gave me a set and it had epsilon in it, that is not equal to the empty set. I'll talk about this in a moment, actually. You're right on the ball. <laughs> but yeah, so the empty set is not the same as the empty string. That's the big thing. Empty string is still a string. Perfect. The natural analogy, if you're familiar with like Java or C++ and that, you can look at, think of the empty string as just two quotes with no, no symbols in it. That's what the empty string looks like. Is that clear to everybody? So normally when you write out like a string and you want to like, okay, I have, the string has no symbols in it yet. You might use, use double quotes and open and close like that. You can think of that as an empty string. Perfect. So. Now that we have the notion of a string, I can talk about building sets of strings. Isn't that wild? I can now build sets of strings. 
So, so I'll say with strings. Yes, what's up? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a look. Yes, I see. I one thing I missed. Does space count as a symbol of string? Okay, now this is where it gets interesting. With our definition, a space would be a symbol in an alphabet. So, for example, if I have one of these alphabets I had over here, you would have as a symbol a space. So a space would be a symbol. And it's actually kind of interesting because like if you look at ASCII, ASCII, a blank space is in fact a symbol in ASCII. Uh, so it's very much like that. So you got to think about the blank space. So if you have like a, just a blank space, that could be conceived as a symbol in, in our notion of what a string is. So the big thing is just a string consists of only the symbols in the alphabet that's used to define it. So for example, if I have a binary string, it only can consist of zeros and ones. There's no spaces allowed because it literally does not have that symbol. Is that clear, everybody? So I like, and I appreciate this, that question because it is actually, it is something to think about, right? So let's, uh, so with strings, we can build sets of strings. Oh dear, the word string there sort of melted in the microwave. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to denote some special sets of strings that we need to be, we'll be using quite often in this class. So I'll be starting off with, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, I'll talk about so-called powers of an alphabet. You're going to find very quickly that when we talk about strings, you're going to remember notion, you might have, has everybody here heard of string concatenation before? So you may know if you take two strings, you can concatenate them together. You can append one onto the other. Uh, we'll have a mathematical way of describing that in a moment. So powers of an alphabet, you're going to find that this is going to be kind of related to this. So I'm going to denote it as sigma with a superscript K. So this is the set the set of all strings, set of all strings of length, length k. So, so let me give you some examples just to motivate this. Uh, so for example, if, if I consider the binary alphabet, like if sigma is equal to 0, 1 like this, then, if I give you sigma s with the squared like this, if I write a 2 right here, could somebody tell me what this set will look like? What is that set going to look like? So think about it. So it's the set of all strings of length 2, right? And it's over 0 and 1. Yep, I see in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, it's zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Perfect. Yeah, that's all of them. Perfect. So you're already pros at this. That's awesome. Zero, one, one, zero, one, one. Perfect. Okay. I'll throw another one at you. Okay. So if I define, if I define sigma with a zero in the super, so if I have zero here, what would that look like? Yeah, yeah, it's epsilon. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a set only containing epsilon. Perfect. Yeah, because it's the set of all strings of length zero, and there's only one string that has length zero. It's the empty string. Perfect. So this is just a set containing epsilon. So remember, as I kind of mentioned earlier, and I'm going to write it up here because it's really important, just it's one of those things that it's one of those easy things to mess up, is that empty set, which is sometimes written as just a set like this. This is, of course, not equal to the set containing the empty set. Just be very clear, because 
One is of clearly empty, one isn't. One has a string in it. Am I clear? Okay, so now I have another conception of another, well, I have another set of strings that I want you to be aware of. This one we're gonna use a lot. Like so much you're gonna see it and it's gonna be like, oh, not again. Actually, I, I'm playing, of course. I'm just saying you're gonna see this one a lot. So this one, it's important that you really understand it. So we're going to, let me just, boom, there we go, perfect. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna define what we, what I'll call sigma star. Uh, sometimes this is called a uh, Kleine star, named after the logician. Stephen Cole Claney. Some of the results in this course are from this logician. Uh, so this is denoted with obviously a sigma and instead of having a, a K here, you have a, an asterisk. So here's how we're gonna define this. This is going to be the set of all possible, all possible strings whose symbols are from, are from, that, that from sort of just melted there, <laughs> from sigma, the alphabet. More formal terms, what I'm telling you is that sigma star is of course equal to sigma to the power of zero. I'm going to combine two sets using a union, so it's just union here. So I have, so it's gonna be sigma zero, sigma one, sigma squared, and so on. Don't ask me where it stops, it doesn't. <laughs> um, so you might ask, so I'll ask you, is this a string that is, sorry, is this a set that's finite or infinite if say the alphabet has at least, has at least uh, one symbol, obviously, because an alphabet is not empty, right? Is this finite or infinite in its size? So, I'll add a caveat because in a way you look at this, it could be finite. If I fix, like if I go back to my definition where I had the power with the K, if I fix K as in it's just a constant, then it technically is a finite number. However, you'll notice that I never really defined any process after this. It just keep, you keep, so this is the set of all strings of length zero, set of one, sorry, length one, length two, length three, length four, length five, length six, length seven, and on and on and on and on forever. <laughs> so, so you can think of any possible combinations of the symbols, like you said, but it's an indefinite process. So you're gonna have an infinite set of strings. Uh, so just as, uh, so is that? Correct, correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, so it's worth, yeah, because you'll notice that you only can have so much finite memory on a computer, but we're gonna be using very abstract notions of a computer, uh, which are capable of doing and encoding any finite numbered sized strings, for example. And if you have to build a machine that can carry and read any length string, it's sort of this abstraction is kind of useful that way. So you don't have to keep saying for every single finite K or something. It's it's just this thing that exists. Um, so I have enough time. I mean, just give me one more minute. I'm gonna define one more thing so I can talk to one last thing and then we'll talk more about it next time, okay? So, uh, so I wanna talk about concatenation. So I already told you about this and it seems like everybody sort of is on board about what con concatenation is. So if I write, um, uh, say we have strings, strings x equal to x1, x2, x3, 
all the way to x sub k sub 1, and y equal to y1, y2, y3, all the way to y sub k2. Then, if I write x, y like this, like a product, so you can think of it like multiplication, uh, that no no that it will make a lot of sense. Then then x y is going to be equal to x one x two da, 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 all the way up to x k sub one, and it'll be appended right to the other string like this. So there's a no the reason why you notice that power notation, the exponents, is because when you have a power. When you have a power, say x to the n like this, does anybody have any idea what that might mean if I raise this, if you think of that like multiplication there? So say if I said x cubed and I told you that x was like 0, 0. I want you to think about it. So if this is why this notation is pretty helpful. So if, see. Actually, I'll let you think about it and I'll, uh, I'll say for example, say if I give you, if x is equal to the string cat, then x cubed would be what? Think about it like that. Remember, x times y, I take the first string and I append it to the next one. So imagine I had x times x, what does that mean? Yep, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. It just repeats the string. Yeah, then x cubed is cat, 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 like this. No spaces at all. It's just cat, 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 like this. So I wanted to find one last thing, and then we'll talk more about it next time, okay? I know I'm going a little bit over here, uh, so hopefully that's okay. I'm just going to define one last thing because I wanted to build up to this. So I'm going to define what is called a language. So I used this word several times in this lecture. I need to define it for you. So it is, it's really going to feel like I'm cheating here. It's going to say it's a set of strings whose symbols come from some alphabet sigma. So whenever I use the word language, I'm talking about a formal language as opposed to natural languages. So that hence why this hence the name, if you think about this course, like it's called formal languages and computability, right? These are going to be the central object of how we talk about all sorts of things in this course. It's just a set of strings whose symbols come from some alphabet. That's all it is. <laughs> um, so I'll give some examples next time. And we'll talk about how languages connect to computational problems next time. And we'll start talking about, depending on how much time we have, we'll start talking about actual talk, we'll start talking about automata. So that being said, I'm going to stop the recording here and I'll wish you a wonderful day. I'll, I'll be right back. I promise. <laughs>